The Chevron Doctrine does not apply to each and every interpretation made by a federal agency. Life would be simpler if it did, but the U.S. Supreme Court has, so far, not kept things simple for us. In the Meade Corp. case, the issue was whether the courts should defer to interpretive decisions stated in tariff classification rulings by customs service examiners. An examiner had issued a ruling that reclassified daytimers, formerly beloved of lawyers, in a way that subjected them to a 4% tariff. Meat Corporation sought judicial review. The Supreme Court held that this type of agency action involved interpretation that did not enjoy the benefit of Chevron deference, but only that lesser consideration that is somewhat misleadingly called Skidmore deference. Justice Souter, now retired from the court, wrote the opinion. We hold that administrative interpretations qualify for Chevron deference when Congress delegated authority, whether expressly or implicitly, to the agency generally to make rules carrying the force of law. Here, when means when and only when. And the agency interpretation claiming deference was promulgated in the exercise of that authority. And when would that be, you might well ask. Delegation of such authority may be shown in a variety of ways, as by an agency's power to engage in formal adjudication or notice and comment rulemaking, or by some other indication of a comparable congressional intent. To get an idea of what this means, but only a sketchy one, you need to be aware of the structure of the APA. The APA distinguishes two types of agency action, rulemaking and adjudication. Every agency action is one or the other, take my word for it for now. And the APA distinguishes two levels of procedural formality, formal and informal. The terms are slippery and can be misleading, but for now, all you need to know is that every agency action belongs in one, but only one, of the four boxes defined by these two cross-cutting distinctions. Each of the four boxes refers us to APA sections that set out the procedures an agency must follow to take an action of a certain type. Don't look at them now. The opinion tells us that Chevron deference normally applies whenever the agent interprets in the course of formal adjudication, the southeastern box, or notice and comment rulemaking, the northwestern box. The opinion doesn't say, but implies, that Chevron normally applies in the formal rulemaking too, the southwestern box. That leaves out the northeastern box, so-called informal adjudication, but there may or may not be indicia that bring the action under Chevron anyway. But those indicia turn out to be absent in the Meade Corp case the court holds. The tariff classification letters would, by the way, be pigeonholed in the Northeast box, sometimes called the dark matter of administrative practice. Why introduce this complication? Justice Souter writes, we have to decide how to take account of the great range of variety. Administrative agencies perform a wide range of different types of function, and Chevron deference is not suited to all of them. In his dissent, spirited of course, Justice Scalia laments the courts losing the Chevron thread. Chevron replaced statute by statute evaluation with an across-the-board presumption that in the case of ambiguity, Agent dis agency discretion is meant. And across the board presumption goes with Justice Scalia's belief that the rule of law demands a law of rules. He hated case-by-case -case determinations by the court because they inevitably turn into balancing exercises that generate not rules, but balancing tests. Balancing tests and case-by-case -case judgments lack the predictability demanded by the rule of law. But why the Chevron presumption across the board? Justice Scalia had gone on to say in a Law Review article, an irresolvable ambiguity can be 
attributed to either of two congressional desires. One, Congress intended a particular result but was not clear about it, or two, Congress had no intent on the subject but meant to leave its resolution to the agency. Chevron presumes that the latter was Congress's intent. If Congress speaks ambiguously, it should assume that the court meant that the Congress meant that the agency, not the court, was to resolve the ambiguity. So ultimately, Chevron is the court's attribution to Congress of a default intention because Chevron told Congress that persistent ambiguities would trigger Chevron deference, Congress was on notice that in the future any statutory ambiguity that did not re readily resolve itself would be taken as a direction to courts to defer to the agency's interpretation. In Justice Scalia's view, the court majority messes this up by throwing in a requirement of formality or other indicia of intent to delegate. In effect, Meade Corp. adds a step zero to the Chevron Doctrine. Lacking indicia that Congress meant to go to steps one and two, the court simply listens to the agency under Skidmore. The agency's reading deserves respect according to the degree of the agency's care, its consistency, formality, and relative expertness, and to the persuasiveness of the agency's position. Justice Scalia and dissent disparages this idea. He says, the rule of Skidmore deference is an empty truism and a trifling statement of the obvious. A judge should take into account the well-considered views of expert observers. This is what we are left with after Meade. In the left column, in descending order, we list the degree to which the agency action is a claim to deference. In the middle column, in descending order, we have the types of deference. And in the right column, the result, if we stipulate the agency reading is reasonable, but the court could do better. If the statute delegates interpretive authority to the agency, the agency reading is due Chevron deference, and the court should affirm the agency even if the court could do better. If the agency took care, but did not qualify for Chevron, it should get Skidmore, but the court should set aside the agency reading if the court can do better. Reasonable must yield to the courts better. Finally, if the agency was not even due Skidmore respect, then the court should impose the better reading, even if the agencies happened to be reasonable. In dissent, Justice Scalia sounds an alarm. Where Chevron applies, statutory ambiguities remain ambiguities subject to the agency's ongoing clarification. But under Skidmore, once the court has spoken, it becomes unlawful for the agency to take a contrary position. Worst of all, the majority support approach will lead to the ossification of large portions of our statutory law. The flexibility Chevron protected is gone where Meade applies. Agencies can recover their fl flexibility by resting their interpretations, restating their interpretations after following procedures that are Chevron eligible, such as notice and comment rulemaking. This seems paradoxical, but, but it would go like this. Time one, agency interpretation I is set aside under Skidmore is not persuasive, permissible, but not the best. Time two, the agency promulgates interpretation I by notice and comment rulemaking. And at time three, and agency interpretation I is upheld under Chevron Step 2. Justice Scalia is not worried that this shows agency disrespect for the judiciary, but he is worried that agencies will be forced to protect themselves by sheltering in the safe harbors of notice and comment rulemaking or formal adjudication. How safe is safe? Justice Breyer, concurring in Brand X, declares that there is no procedural safe harbor. He should know. He co-wrote a casebook on administrative law before joining the court. In any event, Justice Scalia correctly perceived that the court was becoming less enamored with Chevron than he was. The tension breaks out in our next case, City of Arlington. The agency action challenged in City of Arlington versus FCC was an FCC declaratory ruling. 
cell phone service providers complained to the FCC of drawn-out delays in getting state and local authorities to act on applications for permits to erect those hideous towers. They asked the FCC to clarify the statutory term reasonable period of time for state and local authorities to pr process permit applications. The FCC's declaratory ruling determined that a statutory reasonable period of time for new towers would normally be 150 days. The municipality, the municipality challenged the agency action and the Supreme Court was asked not to accord Chevron deference to the interpretation. The municipality contended that Chevron deference does not extend to an agency's interpretation of its own jurisdiction. Justice Scalia, writing what was to be his next to last major Chevron opinion for the court, strongly disagreed. The opinion dismissed the distinction between jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional -jur interpretations as a mirage and pointed out that the U.S. reports are shot through with applications of Chevron to agencies' constructions of the scope of their own jurisdiction. Chevron provides a stable background against which Congress can legislate. Statutory ambiguities will be resolved within the bounds of reasonable interpretation, not by the courts, but by the administering agencies. The tone of the opinion becomes defensive. Make no mistake, the ultimate target here is Chevron itself. The dissenters aver that they came merely to interpret Chevron, not to bury it. But now Justice Scalia is no longer on the court to defend the Chevron doctrine. And his replacement, Justice Gorsuch, had already expressed doubts. The Supreme Court once unanimously declared that a statute affording the executive the power to write an industrial code of competition for the poultry industry violated the separation of powers. Schechter poultry. And if that's the case, you might ask how is it that Chevron a rule that invests agencies with pretty unfettered power to regulate a lot more than chicken can evade the chopping block. A circuit court judge invoking Schechter poultry approvingly is something of a surprise. But there is more news that suggests that the Chevron doctrine is imperiled. Justice nominee Brett Kavanaugh is an even more outspoken critic of Chevron than Justice Gorsuch. While a judge on the D.C. Circuit, he gave speeches declaring that the Chevron doctrine encourages agency aggressiveness on a large scale. Under the guise of ambiguity, agencies can stretch the meaning of statutes enacted by Congress to accommodate their preferred policy outcomes. And on the D.C. Circuit, he wrote, the Supreme Court has required clear congressional authorization for major agency rules, citing Brown and Williamson. Treating Brown and Williamson not as an extraordinary case, but as a permanent qualification of Chevron. The major rules doctrine helps preserve the separation of powers and operates as a vital check on expansive and aggressive assertions of executive authority. He even gave it a name, the Major Rules Doctrine, that no one on the Supreme Court had thought of, or if they had, they did not dare utter it within Justice Scalia's hearing. What is this novel doctrine? In short, while the Chevron Doctrine allows an agency to rely on statutory ambiguity to issue ordinary rules, the Major Rules Doctrine prevents an agency from relying on statutory ambiguity to issue major rules. Emphasis in the original. The Major Rules Doctrine will, in Judge Kavanaugh's view, restore a world in which courts would simply determine the best reading of the statute. Shades of Ronald Dworkin. Courts would no longer defer to agency interpretations of statutes. They would, this would help keep agencies within statutory bounds and help prevent a runaway executive branch that exploits ambiguities in governing statutes to pursue its broad policy aims. 
But don't all sorts of statutes direct agencies to pursue broad policy aims? If Justice Kavanaugh joins and sways the court, then it will decide whether or not an agency interpretation amounts to a major rather than an ordinary rule before it even gets to Chevron step one. We could call this Chevron step zero and a half. Or does a major rules doctrine flatly reverse the presumption once ambiguity is found at step one? Absent a clear statement in the statute, are courts to take Congress to have intended to deny agency authority? Implementing a major rules doctrine requires courts to make yet another case-by-case -case determination. Is the agency interpretation to an integral to an ordinary rule or a major rule? If statutory ambiguity abounds, as of course it must, and if ambiguity in matters the court judges to be major is taken to deny the agencies any leeway in interpreting their statutory directions, then agencies would appear to be as paralyzed as they would be if Congress had no power to delegate authority at all. Under a major rules doctrine, will the court, rather than say the FCC, determine what rules serve the public interest, convenience, or necessity? Will the court, rather than the FTC, determine what is an unfair or deceptive trade practice? Is the Supreme Court's first or next major rules doctrine case destined to become the new Schechter poultry? This is what Justice Gorsuch said as a circuit court judge. In a world without Chevron, very little would change. Well, uh, we shall see.